Amen. So uh, my aim is simple today. Uh, I, I really want you to be able to see that you can be a loved son or you can be a loved daughter of God, of a perfect father. Even more than that, that you can grow in the likeness of your heavenly father in the same way that inevitably all of us, we are growing, going to grow into the likeness of our moms and dads, right? For me, it's going to be my dad. Uh, inevitably, good, bad, or ugly, I just keep looking more like my dad with every passing day. Here's just a quick photo of my dad. This is, this is exactly, almost exactly the same age I am today that he was there, okay? And so there is a, this reality, nobody is arguing the power of genetics over your life, over my life. All of us are going to grow into the likeness of our moms and dads. But even more than that, or at least in conjunction with that, when you spend a lot of time with your mom and dad, when you're living under your, their roof, what's going to happen is not only are you going to grow in their likeness, but then you're going to start talking like them. You're going to start carrying some of their idiosyncrasies. You're going to have some of their mannerisms. And that really is the sort of the baseline for our entire conversation today. So if you got a copy of the scripture, I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, if you're new to Hope City, we've been in this journey through Ephesians for a minute. I think we're uh, somewhere week 27, week 28. I sort of lost count, but could not be more excited. We're finally in chapter 5, which is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. And so we're beginning with verse 1. We're just covering two verses today. Here's what he says. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved Children. So we're his children and he is our father. Now, let me stop there because I just don't presume that everybody in the room today or everybody watching online, that when you think about God as father, you, you think about that in a healthy way. I mean, even when you think about your earthly dad, no matter how you think about your earthly dad, even that is going to contaminate your view of your heavenly father. And so if the aim today is that you and I would grow in the likeness of our heavenly father, then we better make sure that our view of him is pure, is true, is, is right. Because otherwise, what we're striving after, if it's wrong, if it's the wrong view, it is going to be catastrophic for our hearts. I mean, think about it this way. When you think about God as father, some of you, when you, when you think about that, you, you will think about him as a, an, an angry father, somebody that's always on edge, somebody that is just waiting to let you have it if you step out of line. Or when you think about God as father, maybe you think about him as a, I don't know, an aging grandfather, right? Sort of out of touch, doesn't get out very much. The, the text font on his phone is so big you can read it across the room, he's not very good with technology, but he's always got a piece of candy in his pocket for the grandkids, right? Or maybe when you think about God as father, you think about him as a, I don't know, a cosmic scorekeeper. You know, he's always watching, he's always watching the, the makes or the misses in your life, and there's going to be a reckoning over your life. But here, here's what I'm holding on to this morning is it, Colossians 1. He says, in him all things are created. In heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether uh, rule or power or authority, all things are created by him and all things are created for him. And all that means is that God created you and he created you for him. Meaning there is an orbit, there is a gravity to God and all of us are being pulled to see him. But if we see him in a way, if we view him in a way that is flawed, then the rest of our life is going to be totally jacked up in light of that. But here, here's the great news today, if, if you're going to stay with me. The great news is that God isn't just leaving us here by ourselves. He's not like, you got to figure this thing out on your own. No, God's actually gone to great lengths to put on display who he is. And he has done that perfectly through his son, Jesus, when Jesus stepped foot on planet Earth. In fact, let me show you what the Apostle John says, John chapter 1, verse 14. He says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Meaning, Jesus is God. 
personified in the flesh. So the question is if you've ever asked, okay, how do I know what God looks like? The answer to that is you just look to Jesus. That's what God looks like, right? That's who he is. Jesus is God. And so when Jesus was on the earth and he was teaching on the earth, we learn a lot about who God is, right? I mean, we learn that, you know, Jesus is like he's Lord and he's king and he's master and he's omnipotent and he's all powerful. He's all of those things. But the one thing that Jesus keeps coming back to again and again, in fact, 189 different times just in the four gospels, Jesus is like, you want to know what God the Father is like? He is God the Father. I mean, just think about this. When Jesus teaches us to pray, what does he teach us? He's like, here's how I want you to pray. Our, right, he doesn't say our king, oh, omnipotent one, oh, Lord. Like, those are all appropriate, by the way. Those would be good things to pray, but that's not how he teaches us to pray. He's like, if I am going to teach you how to pray, what I want you to pray is our father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen The Father, I and the Father are one. Jesus says, um, let your light shine before men so they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There's literally 189 different places and times that Jesus is like, I don't want you to forget. Yeah, he is all these. God is king. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He He is that. But more than anything, what I want you to see is that God is a father to you. I mean, think about, think about when Jesus is baptized and he's getting in the water and, and in that moment as he's in the water, heaven opens up. And God, the father, looks down and he says, this is my son who I love or whom I love. I'm bad with grammar. Whom I love whom I am well pleased. My point is that God is, God has put something inside of every one of us, meaning every one of us are hardwired as children. Even as adult children, we're all hardwired to long for the affirmation, the unconditional love, the blessing of a father. All of us. I mean, that's why when you were a kid, all of us, you're standing on the edge of the pool, you're doing a backflip, what are you saying? Daddy, did you see it? And was it good? Right, and then you grow up a little bit and, and you're like, dad, are you coming to the, I mean, moms get the shaft here. It's like, dad, are you coming to the game? Dad, are you gonna watch the, my dance recital? Are you, and so, and then we grow up and we realize if we, if we did not receive the affirmation, the love, the unconditional blessing of the Father, there's a gap in us. And sometimes, because God's really gracious, because he is so kind to us, sometimes that gap gets filled by somebody else, by a coach or a teacher or an uncle. That happens sometimes. But one way or the other, we can look back on our own history and go, because we didn't receive the blessing, the affirmation, the, the unconditional kindness of a father, there's something happening. There's a chink. There's a fracture in our soul. And so go back to the, the baptism of Jesus. Jesus is getting baptized and he hasn't done anything yet. Like he, he, hasn't, he hasn't, you know, gone into ministry yet. He hasn't preached his first sermon yet. He hasn't turned water into wine yet. He hasn't walked on water. He hasn't healed anybody. He hasn't ruined a funeral. He hasn't died for the sins of humanity. He hasn't done any of that. And yet he's getting baptized. And what happens? Heaven opens up and, and God the Father's like, that's my boy. I love him. I am so pleased with him. He hasn't done anything yet. I'm so pleased with him. This should stir something up in our hearts. It stirs something up in my heart because it it should remind us that that when, when God the Father sent Jesus, the Son, out, he, he sent him out blessed. He didn't send him out going, um, let's just see how this thing goes, and then, then, uh, then I'll give you my blessing. No, he sent Jesus out 
blessed. He sent him out with the affirmation. He sent him out with the full blessing of heaven on him. And he's like, just because you're the son, you are blessed. And when the blessing of the father was on the son, inevitably it stirred up the deepest kind of trust in the son. The reason I know that is when Jesus went to the cross, his worst day, by the way, when he experienced rejection, experienced the absolute abandonment of everybody that had said yes to him, he's all alone. And in that moment, what does he do? His eyes drift back heavenward to the father and he says, into your arms do I commit my spirit. And so unconditional blessing, unconditional love of the Father always stirs up a kind of trust to him to say, okay, now that I've received the blessing, I've received the, the love that is, is mine, not because I've accomplished anything, but simply because I'm a son, now I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to do something with that. You're going to lead me somewhere I wouldn't normally go, but, but because I have the affirmation of heaven, it's taken me somewhere. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 2 now. He says, and walk in love, meaning the affirmation, the love of the Father that is so extravagant, that's not predicated on anything that you've done, that love that's been poured out on you, now I want you to walk in that. He says that the same way that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So a couple ideas I want to hold on to as, as we look at verse 2 today. The first is this, is that kind of love, that kind of gospel, ferocious love, it is not about being nice. Now, some of you think you're winning with that because you're like, perfect, I'm never nice. Okay, I am an absolute jerk. Okay, no, that's a different subject, okay? And that's just because you're a big jerk. You need to really repent and, or maybe come to the Lord. I don't know. But gospel love is not about being nice. And the reason I, I chose that language is because niceness in church culture, has we've turned it into a virtue. It's the ultimate virtue in the church now. Right? And, and it, but it shouldn't be. It actually, niceness is like the enemy of gospel love. Because what niceness has become is this castrated, neutered version of what the extravagant love of God is designed to be in our life. L let me say it this way. When Jesus loved and when we love like Jesus, it's almost always going to offend religious people. And will almost always be attractive to non-religious people. Yeah. Okay, let me say it in a way that if you're not offended yet, this is designed to offend, okay? <laughs> when, when you and I, when we walk in the love of God, and again, like it's, it's, it's a supernatural love that's been given to us because of the supernatural affirmation over our life. If you're walking in today and you're measuring your your receptivity of the love of God based on your behavior record this week, of course you feel far away from God. But if you walk, walk into the house this morning going, I'm a train wreck, I, have, I, I'm, I haven't done anything right this week, I have disobeyed a hundred different times, I've hurt everybody's feelings, I have disappointed my wife, I've hurt my children, I've done all of that, but none of that is predicated on the love of God. Meaning the love of God is simply because you're a son and daughter of God. And the love then moves us to, to live a life of extravagance. But he, here, here's my point. When you and I love the way that Jesus loves, when we, when we, because when Jesus loved, he loved in such an extravagant kind of way that the religious people thought it was so wasteful. That's, they really did. They used that language of waste. And, and the reason they thought that, I mean, these are religious people that only are comfortable painting by numbers, right? Like things have got to make sense on a, on a ledger sheet. But when Jesus loved that way, when he loved in, in such an extravagant way, it was that kind of love that ultimately got him killed. It was that kind of love that did not make sense to them because he was loving people that could not give back to him. 
He was loving prostitutes. He was loving tax collectors. He was loving people on the religious fringe. And Jesus is, is demonstrating for us that the kind of love that is born out of an affirmation of the Father is always going to be most attractive to those on the edge and is going to be most offensive to the middle. Yeah. He's like, but that's the love I'm, I'm calling you to. It's the kind of love I'm inviting you to, the kind of love that's so extravagant that it's going to offend the base. But your eyes are going to be set on the edge, on those that have not yet experienced the love of God. Let me say one more thing, but just before I forget. Um, when, when you and I love the way that Jesus loves, um, you should prepare your heart to be rejected. Like, it's, it's one thing. We, we're in a culture that, that not only have we made niceness a virtue, we've also made offense a virtue. We're like, oh, it's really good to offend people. Right? I mean, like some of you, the reason you're jerks is because somehow you think like, because I'm a jerk for Jesus, like that's not, that's not gospel love. That's not gospel love. But when, when our love is so extravagant, when our love is so outside the kind of the boundaries of, of what religious people would say is appropriate, you should be prepared to get rejected by religious people. But this is why we hold so ferociously to the affirmation of the Father. Meaning, if you get rejected by men, but you have the affirmation of the Father, then you're fine. Yeah. I'm not saying you're, you're not going to experience pain and you're not going to shed a thousand tears because rejection is awful. But if you, if you are rejected by men, you're rejected by your friends, but you're affirmed by your Heavenly Father, then you're okay. But the, the opposite is also true, and this is where it's going to hurt some of your feelings is if you spend your life in pursuit of the affirmation and the blessing of men, you can count on the rejection of God. There is a mutual exclusivity to worship. And the greatest form of idolatry today is, is people pleasing. Like we want the love of men. We want the applause of men. We want people to, to be pleased by us. But if you spend your life Pursuing the applause of men or the, the affirmation of men, you cannot, by nature, get the affirmation of the Father. They're mutually exclusive. Yeah. I mean, think about the, the first command out of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. And so if the God before you is, I want people to love me, I want people to, to applaud me, I want people to see how amazing I am, then, then there is nothing left in your heart to pursue the affirmation and to receive the blessing of the Father. Here's the second thought. Love, the kind of love we're talking about, will always move us towards sacrifice. I mean, again, look at verse 2. And walk in love. Again, this love that we've been given. Walk in that love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, for clarity, the love we're talking about is not redemptive in nature, meaning we are not Jesus, okay? When he says walk in that love, he's not saying walk in the love of Jesus, like because Jesus went to the cross, right? Jesus, his love was redemptive in nature, meaning he took our sin, he took our shame, he became a curse for us so that we could be called sons and daughters of God. The way that we love is not redemptive in that way, right? Like you, the way that you love people will not save people, okay? But the same spirit that caused Jesus to rise from the dead lives in, if you know him, lives inside of you. And so your love is empowered by heaven. It's the same love that Jesus has, but it's, it's given for a different purpose. He's like, I want you to love in such an extravagant way to get people's eyes on him. Now, the, the, the challenge of this, because he says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The, the reminder is that love, the love we're talking about, it is, is going to cost you. This is why it's not niceness. It, it's like by nature, sacrifice 
it, it's sacrificial. It's going to hurt you. Now, there's a, I was thinking about this as I was writing this. Like, there's a lot of ways that love will cost us. But I just want to focus on one because I, I think this is where we're living in our history. Is one of the challenges, one of the, the ways that loving people is going to be difficult for many of you is that, that you're going to be tempted to love in a really extravagant way and then to post about it. To Instagram about it. Like you, you want to make your, it's, it's so extravagant. It's just, it just makes sense. You want other people to celebrate in your extravagance, right? But, but let, me, let me say this in, in, a, in, a, in a way, because I, I do like wordplay. So let me say it this way. If, you're lo- if, you, if you love God in such a way that, it's, it, that you're doing it in a way to monetize the applause of men, then it ceases to be love. Like if you're loving people to get people to love you and to applaud you and to celebrate you, it stops being love. It starts becoming narcissism. Let me say this in a, in a way that may, maybe makes more sense. Um, here's how we know we grow in love. It, one way. One way is that when we grow in the love of Jesus and it's extravagant and it is out of the box and it's so kind and it doesn't make sense, we we begin to love in that kind of way. You know you're growing in that when you have a growing comfort level to love in in spaces and places in which no one will ever know about it. To like not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. That's how you know, like, let me put it this way. Um, Right now, 300 million digital photos are taken a day and and uploaded to Instagram. So many more millions are are taken. So we're living right now in a snap and upload kind of culture, right? Snap. Upload So 300 million uploaded immediately to Instagram. The vast majority of those are, are selfies, by the way. So no, nobody's arguing we are the most narcissistic, self-absorbed culture in the history of man, okay? But when I was growing up, and, and I'm not saying this to say we were more virtuous. We, we, we had different problems, okay? But when I was growing up, we had what was called a, a 35 millimeter camera. Anybody remember the 35 millimeter? Okay, so a few of you were alive. And so the way the 35 <laughs> millimeter camera worked in the 70s and 80s is you had, to, you had to, to get film, physical film, and you had to put it into the camera all by yourself. And then you, you took the 24 exposures and then you had to take the film out of the camera, again, all by yourself. And then you had to drive it over to the Walgreens and you had to pay the $3.99 for them to develop that film. And then you just prayed and fasted that, that they got your pictures back to you after the promised six days. And so you're leaving and you're like, are you sure you've got it? And they're like, we've got it. The little 16 year old kid that's making $2 an hour, you're like, you don't have it, right? But you're leaving it just on faith, right? I'm gonna get those pictures back. And then you, you drive off and then they take that, the, the, that film and they put it on a truck and they drive it to Milwaukee or Cleveland or wherever the development center is. And then they take the film and then they walk it into a dark room. And then after nine chemical processes hit that film, your picture gets burned onto what's called a negative. Now here's the problem, is if the, the dark room door is prematurely open and light comes in at the wrong time and shines in on that negative, then all of your photos are lost. My point is, is simply this, is um, culturally, we are a snap and upload kind of culture. Snap and upload. We take the picture, we immediately upload it into the cloud. Not a lot of development happening. So there, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're a church that really believes God speaks to us and the Holy Spirit's always moving. And so some of you are like, man, God spoke to me. God, God told me I'm going to be the next big thing. I'm going to be the next famous worship leader or I'm going to be an author or I'm going to be an influencer. People are going to know my name. Can I, can I just be the bad guy and just tell you, God is not interested at all in you getting discovered. Amen. But he is interested in you being developed. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is we have whole generations of, of Christians in the church. And, I, and this, is not, this is not an age problem. This isn't the people over 60 going, yeah, those 18-year-olds, you need to get your act. We've got whole generations, 18 to 85, that have no idea of what it means to be developed in the dark room. 
We have no idea what it means to be in the dark room of prayer. No idea what it means to be in the dark room of worship. No idea what it means to be in the dark room of suffering. No idea what it means to be in the dark room where we lay our sins down. No idea what it means to be in the dark room where we're loving a friend or we're on the side of the road doing good works, not so we can post about it, but so we can treasure it knowing that's where we grow when no one else sees. And so there's this invitation to our house, like inviting us to go into the places of shadows where no one else sees. Because the places of of significance that you long for are never found in the public square. The places of significance are always found when your ears clearly hear the affirmation of the Father. Our, uh, our worship team had a, had a training, had a kind of a huddle a few weeks ago and do this a couple times a year just, just to cast vision, just to remind them of like what, what we're about, what we're after. And it's so important to, to have our, our, the people on stage to get some of this. Um, and the reason is, is I, I contend the stage in, in, in this circle, the stage is always the most dangerous place. It's always the most dangerous place. Usually the most gifted people, often with the least amount of character resources are invited to the stage. Not necessarily here, but I'm saying in, in the church in large. And I remember telling our, our, our team a few weeks ago, I was like, listen, if, if you like the stage, it's probably good for you to get yourself off the stage. Like if there's something about having a mic that, that is enamoring to you, if, if you're on stage and you're inviting people to come watch you lead worship, you should probably be off the stage. But I tell you that because this is just a microcosm of life. Like this stage is just a microcosm of, of where you and I live. If, if you're regularly inserting yourself into conversations so people will applaud you, if, if you find yourself posting things so that people will like it, reshare it, so people will think you're clever or wise, if you find yourself regularly playing the victim card, you know, I wish people just did this or liked me this way, or like if you find yourself trying to create orbit around yourself, the only reason is because you haven't clearly heard the affirmation of the Father. That's the only reason. No condemnation to that. It's only because you haven't yet heard how pleased the Father is with you. Because when that happens, all of that is just feels so foolish. Why don't we stand together? I want to invite our, our prayer team to come forward. Here's the thing. Uh, I have a unique, a unique position on Sunday mornings, but... While I was speaking today, like very clearly the Holy Spirit was, was working on many of you. Like uh, a, a, a dozen, a dozen, just like a dozen of you, just while I was speaking, just, just tears, just tears. Some of it was over 
the realization of a lack of a father. Some of it was just, I think, just the Spirit of God reminding you, like, your behavior is not what defines you. Like, the blessing of heaven is not predicated on how well you do today. So I only say that because I, like I just I know the Spirit of God's at work, and there's something that happens when when you and I take a step forward and we say, okay, I'm I'm going to respond to this thing that I, I've sensed God doing, and and I I don't know what that means. I don't know for me to take a step forward and ask for prayer or to come kneel and for me just to cry out to God. Whatever it is, we want to be a people that are, are tender to respond to him. So Holy Spirit, we, we invite you to come now, point our hearts now back to the Son.